so we just wanted to wish her some uh, speedy healing and speedy recovery. Um, so I will be uh, acting as the chair for the evening. Um, I would like to call our new Executive Officer of Communications and Community Engagement, Sean Braystead, up to help lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which I stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we get started, I would like to make uh, a motion to amend our agenda, and I would like to make the motion to allow Dr. Battle to make a statement immediately before uh, our public <coughs> participation. Second. Second. All right. All in. Fa any, any discussion? <laughs> all in favor? Okay. All right. So we're going to start out with the good news, and we will have Glencliff High School ambassadors first up to speak. Good evening. Good evening. I am Tommy Davis, the academy coach at the Glencliff High School, um, and I come bringing greetings from our executive principal, Mr. Clint Wilson, who's not able to be with us this evening because he is sick as well. Um, our awesome student ambassadors are going to share with you their academy story. Uh, so without any further ado, the Glencliff High School Academy ambassadors. Good evening. I am Mom Tran. I am the Academy of Environmental and Urban Planning and the Pathway of Biotechnology. I am Denzel Harris, part of the Ford Academy of Business and Innovation and the Pathway of Entrepreneurship. I am Heyman Yassin. I am in the Academy of Health and Hospitality and in the Pathway of Culinary Arts. I am Alex Vilanco, a part of the Academy of Environmental and Urban Planning and the Pathway of Biotechnology. And I am Farah Shahan, and I am in the Academy of Health and Hospitality and I'm in the Pathway of Culinary Arts. And, and we, we are, are the senior, senior head ambassadors, ambassadors at Glencliff High School. Today. <laughs> um, today we are going to talk about our academy stories and our experiences at Glencliff High School. When I first started at Glencliff, I was such a shy person that I spoke little to nothing. But because of my academy and my ambassador team, I was able to break out of that comfort zone and stand here today in front of everyone and speaking. Um, I participated in many competitions, including the Soil Judging and TSU Convention as an FFA member. I also um, am a member of House of Representatives, Tennis Club, Beta Club, and many other extracurriculars. All these opportunities led me to become a better leader and to improve my communication skills. All right, so being part of my academy, <laughs> which is a uh, uh, academy and pathway, which is heavily based on biotechnology. Uh, gave me new, you know, perspectives on biotechnology, and you know, it was also eye-opening. Uh, one of the academy experiences that I had is we went to the Hope Camp greenhouses here in Nashville. Uh, it was such an eye-opening to me just to see all the different plants and how each plant is processed differently, or like how each plant is planted differently. It was also uh, eye-opening to me just because uh, since being a Laos, our culture is heavily based on agriculture and gardening, and my parents love to garden. So what I want to do in the future, uh, as my parents get older, you know, they may not be able to garden as much. But I want to help them use my knowledge from what I learned in my academies and all my academy experiences to help them garden, to you know, teach them new ways of gardening, or just to help them you know, plant, plant a plant. So. Um, Glencliff High School was one of the first schools to have the, the mariachi program, the Best Buddies program, as well as our International Day program, and restorative practices. <coughs> um, Tennessee, uh, we don't really have a lot of schools that do mariachi. Um, so being a part of a school that's such an, an open-minded school is really amazing because they have all these various uh, extracurricular activities, which I'm a part of at least 10, I would say. Um, but the three that I have impacted me the most is my ambassador team with these amazing people, um, the girls' soccer team, and uh, my student government association program. Uh, being in the girls' soccer team, I was originally in the, vars the junior varsity team. I did not know how to play at all. I didn't know any of the rules. I was just a soccer <coughs> player. And um, I was really nervous. And my coach said if I had uh, practiced enough and if I could uh, get better, that I would be bumped up to the varsity team. So I had spent all my weekends, all my days after school, practicing with other girls on the team and bettering myself, which showed me that determination and perse perseverance can get me my, uh, to achieve my goals in life. Um, being an ambassador at Glencliff has opened many different opportunities <coughs> and has also helped me network with our very own business partners. 
at one of our advisory board meetings, I had the honor in meeting uh, our uh, our uh, business partner from Meharry, Dr. Susan DeRemer. Dr. Susan DeRemer introduced me to Opportunity Now, who, who <coughs> helped, and they helped me get an, um, apply for an internship at Meharry. After applying, luckily I got accepted, and that really helped me open my eyes for what I want to do with my future, and um, also helped me get the learning experience. As I came into Glencliff High School as a freshman, I didn't really know what it would be like. There were many different cultures that I was not used to. I was used to only black and white, because that's where I grew up from, that was the only cultures that were around. But as I came around Glencliff, I became more aware of the cultures that are around us and how our different knowledge of these cultures can impact us. We have our International Day where we celebrate our cultures and where we tell people that where you come from and who you are does matter. It doesn't matter where you come from because we'll still love you, we'll still be with you, and we're still a family. And Glencliff's motto is diversity is our strength. It's not a weakness. It's not a hindrance. It's our strength. And that's why I say that Glencliff is one of the greatest schools in the nation because the diversity that we have prepares us for the real world and it helps us understand each other even better. Thank you for your time. Have a happy holiday. Thank you. Get a picture? Do I do it? I think it's free. <laughs> Glencliff. <laughs> okay, so I get it. Like I I think after I speak, so people speak with it. Next up, Ms. Elrod is going to speak about our Overton High School artwork, which is displayed on the, the side of the wall here. Thank you. Sure. So um, often working on a sketchbook is a solo experience, and they asked that their students would work with their ideas in a new project and experiment with new kinds of media. So those students, as you can see here, they participated in a sketchbook swap, which I think is, frankly, a really interesting idea. Students created sketchbooks. They filled them halfway with their own art, and then they added prompts to the blank pages and then sent them off to other students within our school system. And then those students completed the rest of the sketchbook. So it helped them in a variety of student artwork um, to focus on student expression and their forms of identity. And it all just focused on that theme of identity. I think it's a really interesting piece of um, way to share art and to collaborate on artwork together. And it's under it's done under Kimberly DeFries at the Overton High School Art Teacher. And I really encourage everybody to go look at it and um, consider their own artwork that they might be doing at home. Thanks. And we just had a wonderful performance by the STEM Prep Charter School. Uh, their choir came and sang for us. If For those that missed it, they did a wonderful job. Um, and so I'm going to invite Ms. Bugs to say a few words about their choral program. Yes, thank you. So Mr. Creedon Irons and Ms. Allie Brazil uh, helped support these students, and we want to thank them and all of the work that they put into or poured into these students, as well as the work of Dr. Kristen McGrainer. If you were here at the beginning, you heard the bio of Mr. Creighton's and all the work that they've done, but they performed This Is Me in the, the, from The Greatest Showman and Better Than the Old Me, which is a STEM prep original that was written by Mr. Creighton and Ms. Brazil. So please give them a round of applause. Thank you, STEM prep, in your absence. Okay, moving on to awards and recognitions. We'll start with Pearl Cone Entertainment Magnet High School football team. Okay, so at this time, I would like to invite up Coach Brunetti, um, Executive Principal Miriam Harrington, and everyone who's here representing Pearl Cone Firebir Firebirds football team. As I watched throughout the season and Friday night in Cookville, I kept thinking about what a perfect example of the power and beauty of teamwork, striving together towards a common goal, each member using his own unique talent, executing a well-structured plan. 
2019 Pearl Cone football is a great team. Pulling together, they finished an undefeated season, regular season, and marched through the playoffs to finish 14-1 and and state 3A football runner-up. Let's give them a round of applause. Years from now, when the records are broken and memories of wins and losses have faded, like for all great teams, it is the relationships with teammates and coaches that will last. For the 2019 Pearl Cone Firebirds, that bond will endure forever. Congratulations, and please know that we are proud of you. Great work. Um, coach, um, coaches, principal, would anyone like to take a moment to say anything before we take a quick picture? Um, how you doing? I'm Coach Harris. I'm not Coach Bernetti. Um, yeah, he's sick. Um, <laughs> we all know how they go when you lose. Uh, but uh, one thing we wanted to really do, um, Procon, you know, we like to be in the news for a lot of positive stuff. So there was one thing this season has done for us. We was um, able to be real positive on the news and do real well. And we also wanted to carry the city on our back. Uh, unfortunately, we let the city down, oh, but hopefully dang. we'll be back next year. Um, we was also, coaching-wise, we was blessed to have great kids like Wesley here, um, which is a Vanderbilt scholarship recipient. Anchor down, so, baby, anchor down. Um, yeah, like I said, we we did want to hold it down for Metro. Next year, we promise we'll try to do bigger and better things. And um, Percon is still be here, going to be there. And that's the best school. I know Glen Cliff, we like to thank them because <laughs> they let us use their field, um, which was real nice of them. But uh, I thank Percon because I went to Percon, so I think that's the best school. So. Five our nation. I just want to say, uh, this is my second year at Pearl Cone, and um, I, when I first got there, I was like, we're still in the season? And it was in December, and it was like, yes, and just to feel the spirit of the city surround the school was great, and the kids knew. Like, they really, you know, felt like they weren't on an island. Like, they felt supported by this entire city, and that was great. And there's a great coaching staff. I know you talked about the kids are great. There's a great coaching staff. They spend a lot of time just working with the kids and spending time with, with those guys, um, finding scholarships for, for the boys and ensuring that each kid that comes into their program has a, um, has a pathway into the next level in college. And so um, last year we had um, eight boys to uh, go on to college, uh, two at Vanderbilt, UT Knox, Austin P. like all full rides, and we have several who have already been offered full rides in 10th grade already and 11th grade. So we're looking forward to continuing the season, but also continu continuing in having student athletes and scholars. Thank you, we're proud of you. Come on up for a quick picture. Okay, and for our final award and recognition, we have the Hume Award, and I would like to recognize Wesley Schelling of MLK Magnet High School. <laughs> Since 1944, the Hume Award has been presented to an outstanding scholar-athlete football player in Metro schools. Candidates are chosen on the basis of scholarship, sportsmanship, individual performance, and value to the team. Each year, the award is presented at a local community, business, and service organization. Last week, I had, I had the pleasure of attending the 76th presentation of the Hume, Four, Hume Award at the lunch meeting of the Rotary Club of Nashville. The five finalists were recognized along with their parents and coaches. 
The winner of the 2019 Hume Award is Wesley Schelling, an outstanding student at Martin Luther King Jr. Magnet School and an important member of the region champion state runner-up 14-1 Pearl Cone football team. Wesley will be taking his talents, academic and athletic, to Vanderbilt University next year. Congratulations, Wesley. Thank you for inviting me to this meeting. Uh, it is fun to be recognized for accomplishments, especially the team one that we just had. Um, I like to recap the season as well as co what Coach Harris just said. Uh, historic run, first team go undefeated into the state championship, and uh, lost to an Alcoa team that has won five straight and 18, uh, three A or 18 state titles. So they're. Uh, powerhouse over there in Knoxville, so nothing to take away from our season uh, from that loss, but we uh, ended really well on a high note, and uh, I'd also like to thank Coach Brunetti, who's not here, but he uh, has helped me out, and uh, the coaching staff has helped out as well with uh, just making me a better player, and he also gets his guys scholarships, as Ms. Harrington just said, and uh, he's provided opportunities for me to start at the varsity level, and uh, Friday was my 55th consecutive start as a long snapper at Pearl Cone. And, uh, but he's been great. And I'd also like to thank Dr. McShepard Ray back here. Uh, she has worked very hard at MLK as the principal and uh, has created a powerhouse academic magnet school that's recognized nationally as a top magnet school. Thank you. Thank you. nasty little virus that they all have. All right, next up we're going to move into public participation, but before we get to that um, step, step, we're going to allow Dr. Battle to read a statement. Thank you, Ms. Frog and um, board members. Um, as you are aware, there has been a claim of wage theft related to the McMurray Middle School renovations. Those claims were shared at the last board meeting, and I took them very seriously. I urged our team and our lead, David Prophet, to strongly encourage Orion Construction to find a solution to this issue and ensure that everyone who worked on their job site was paid appropriately. Since that time, our staff has been working with our team and the contractor on this project to seek an equitable and fair solution to this dispute. At our request, the contracting parties met to discuss the issues and tried to come to a common understanding of the facts. However, there still remain barriers to an agreeable solution by all parties. Normally, contractual disputes like this will be settled by mediators or courts, but we are trying to facilitate a productive path forward towards a quick resolution. To be clear, Metro Schools has paid for all of our contractual obligations for the work performed at McMurray Middle School. However, we should and will continue to do what we can to hear out and help where possible. 
Shortly before this meeting, Orion and MPS staff received previously unreleased information from RSA via Workers' Dignity. And so we have requested another meeting of all parties, also to include MPS to review the facts and try to come to an understanding. We would urge all parties to cooperate and provide as much information as possible and work in good faith towards an equitable resolution. In addition to the disputes over payments on this contract, there has been a request that contractors hold bonds when performing work for MMPS. This already occurs. However, those bonding companies would likely need the same documentation that Orion is requesting in order to pay out any claims. Going forward, the Facilities and Construction Department will require co contractors and all subcontractors have written contracts for work being performed. That way, if there is a wage theft claim or payment dispute in the future, there will be more documentation to help get to the bottom of the situation efficiently. As a director <coughs> and as an organi organization, we do not take these claims lightly and we have been working to see them resolved. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and have uh, public participation. Uh, you should see your name on the screen. There it is. And if you would go ahead, as you see your name, go ahead and line up here on the right side of the room, your left side of the room. Um, each uh, participant will be allowed three minutes, and when you hear the bell ring, that means your time is up. There it is. And, um, and I will have to cut you off at that point. Um, the board does not respond to public participation at board meetings, but we're here to listen. So we will uh, begin with Alfredo Pena. No? Okay. Uh, Raynell Stelly Cummings. Okay. Vivian Wilhoyt, there she is. Good evening. Good evening, Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Adrian Battle. I am Vivian Wilhoyt, your property assessor, not your tax assessor, for the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County. Over the last four years, I have served as the assessor of property for our great city and county. For a little over a year, I've had the pleasure of speaking to a number of students in our great public and private schools. Invited by Mrs. Raylene Snaphoff, a freshman seminar teacher at Cambridge High School, it was then when I discovered that the information that we provide serves as a learning tool in helping our students to better understand government, mathematics, statistics, history, and history with a basic a basis for critical thinking, as well as learn of best practices for how we, the Office of Assessments, arrive at valuation of real property, both residential and commercial, and personal property in mass appraisal. With one of my fellow colleagues, Randy Ward, we presented to the students the same information that we've provided to well over 150, at well over 150 community meetings to help property owners and future property owners to learn about how we arrive at valuation of what may be their biggest purchase of their life, a home or a business. As a result, seeing the interest and the engagement of the student, students, Ms. Snaffoff invited us back to conduct more classroom teaching sessions on property assessments. To date, we have conducted more than 10 classroom teaching sessions. My office also participates in the newly established program, Hillsboro High STEP, which stands for Student Empowerment Program, a program developed by a parent, Angela Stone, to expose, to expose students to professions other than those commonly known. In this case, and as for my office, professions like appraiser, IT-related professions, or even assessor, a student learned firsthand about such professions to which they would normally not be exposed. I, Assessor Wilhoyt, and the Office of Assessments want to continue our partnership with the school system and has established a curriculum called Student Outreach, just that simple, for the opportunity to invite, to invite, to be invited to educate students on the topic of property assessments. Thank you, Mrs. Snuffoff, if you're, if you're watching, and Mrs. Angela Stone for their inspiration on this endeavor. To the board and the viewing educators, please feel free to utilize us in providing this valuable information by calling my office at 615-862-6080 or email me at vivian.wilhoyt at nashville.gov. We will do all the good we can for all of the students we can in every way that we can while we can. Thank you for your time and happy holidays. 
Chris you can clap now. <laughs> All right, Chris Moth. Hey, Merry Christmas. I'm Chris Moth, parent of a Hillsborough grad with two other children still in MNPS. I'm responding here to your decision to expand Valor Charter. Two meetings ago, Dr. Gentry stated, and I quote, we started a conversation called MNPS Next to address performance and enrollment concerns. That conversation has fallen by the wayside. So I cannot, in good conscience, deny an opportunity for parents to make choices that are good for their kids when we are not stepping up and improving the options and opportunities in our community schools. <laughs> MNPS has repeatedly developed strategic plans and then abandoned them. I worked on Pedro Garcia's strategic plan before this board fired him. As a PAC chair, I gave input to Dr. Joseph's excellent transition plan, but you fired him too. I'm saddened to think that both MNPS Next and the K through Second Literacy Blueprint are also now dead. Ask yourselves, why do we work so hard developing strategic plans for the benefit of all our children, but then not direct all our energies and actions toward making those great plans happen? Last meeting, Ms. Elrod attempted to focus you all. She said, we have to do the best we can for the many, not the few. But you didn't listen to her. And once again, you voted for the few, just as you did when you expanded MLK, when you created Meg's and Rose Park auto pathways, and when you approved the David Fox rezoning, and on and on. With your expansion of Valor, you are repeating those voices from your minutes books, the decades of past voices who say, let's make a few parents happy today, and we'll get around to the whole district some other time. Let's review Valor Charter. First, in 2014 or so, you unanimously approved Valor without ever, ever telling us why. Since then, none of you have even bothered to attend a Valor board meeting, so to see how they execute their ambitious strategic plans. Last month, you sneaked the charter amendments onto your agenda without any opportunity for public comment. In your meeting, you noted that Valor reneged on their charter application promise to open an elementary school and that their secret private lottery had resulted in over-enrollment. Who on this planet rewards contractors who fail to do promised work or fail to interface with your proven IT systems? If they had used Chris Weber's office, their numbers mess would never have happened in the first place. At any rate, by one vote, you decided that it was a good thing to send another four million bucks a year of our money to this vendor. Look, if you really believe that families should be able to stay in a school continuum, then increase the seats at Overton High so that all the kids at Croft in Ms. Elrod's district can continue in their pathway. Far too many Croft kids are forced out because of lack of seats. Why are Croft's families and their choices less compelling and urgent to you than Valor's? And then, if you really want to get strategic, maybe make Todd Dixon your next director of schools because he certainly knows how to execute a strategic plan. Focused, convincing, and strategic execution is what is so sadly missing from this district. Merry Christmas and best wishes for a more strategic 2020. All our kids deserve nothing less. Thank you both all very much. Richard Montgomery. Okay, I'm going to do my best to pronounce these names. I had to get tutored by Ms. Pippa Walker, so bear with me. Um, we have Armando Arsate. Did I miss one? Elizabeth Hines. Okay. Elizabeth Hines. I'm sorry. Let me let me let our, uh, Elizabeth Hines first. I'm, uh, my apologies. That was my mistake. Good evening, Madam Chair. School board members and Dr. Battle, my name is Elizabeth Hines and my address is 4856 Lynn Drive. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I would also like to thank, take a moment to congratulate Ms. Player Peters, our new school board member for District 7. I wish you all the best and please know I'm a supporter of you and I hope that we can work together very soon. I saw you in the bathroom, I didn't want to bother you. Um, <laughs> I've come here today with, very, with good intentions to tell you about an event I witnessed and to ask for an explanation. Um, in the last quarter of 2018-2019 school year, I subbed for a science teacher in the middle school on a Thursday. The next day I received a text message from that teacher asking if I could return that morning to sub for a math teacher who'd had a family emergency. I told her I could not dedicate the full school day, but I could volunteer for a few hours that morning. She welcomed my offer. I arrived at the middle school about 30 minutes into the first period. We gathered all the seventh uh, graders from their various classrooms that they were in and we brought them into the math classroom. We took the chairs off the table and we began the lesson. I knew we weren't gonna get a whole lot done that day. About 10 minutes or so later, the AP, the assistant principal and a female police officer entered the room. The AP announced that the police were here to perform a random drug search. 
The, poli the uh, policewoman instructed all the girls to remove their sweatshirts and sweaters and leave their personal belongings in the classroom. And then she asked all of us to step outside and she told the boys to do the same. Uh, we were told to line up against the lockers and face each other. Um, there were two police officers and a, and a dog and a canine sitting outside the classroom. Um, one male police officer and the canine went inside the classroom and the second police officer stood in the hallway um, facing us. Um, the female police officer then asked us to remove our shoes and you know, bang our shoes together. She said to see if anything was inside and it would fall out. Um, myself and the students complied. Well, she told me I didn't have to participate, but I told her I was gonna um, participate with the students. Um, then the police officer proceeded to use a metal detector to wave um, around the students. She didn't use it on me. Um, this school does not have um, end of period bells. So while we're all outside the classroom, the period ended and all of the students um, came outside the building. Um, that weekend, I, le I left the school and that weekend I was very depressed because I, the experience was just unusual. I'd never seen anything like this before. So I guess my question is I would like to know if the parents were notified that that happened to their children that day. Um, I would like to know if this was something, this is something that happens frequently in middle schools. And just wanted to, I guess, guess you got, get you guys thinking about what's happening to some of our middle schools and to get some input from you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I now I'm gonna call up Mr. Arsate again. Thank you. <clears throat> Buenas noches nuevamente. Gracias por permitirnos estar aquí. Good evening. Um, thank you for allowing us to be here today. El motivo por el cual estamos aquí es porque aún no nos han pagado, no hemos resuelto este problema. Eh, quiero decirles que las cantidades que Orion presentaba, esas ya las habíamos aclarado con el señor Malcolm Pérez en la escuela de Vanderbilt en Divinidad. So, um, I just wanted to uh, say a couple of things um, that you may have heard. Uh, the amounts that Orion has um, talked about or raised that of the money that we're owed for the McMurray work um, was already clarified with him and others and Mr. Michael Perez, the procurement officer at Vanderbilt University. El señor Michael Perez les había dejado muy claro que esas cantidades eran exclusivamente de la Escuela de Divinidad en Vanderbilt, que él no se quería meter con la Escuela de McMurray Middle School. Uh, Mr. Michael Perez um, from Vanderbilt uh, made it very clear that the amount of money that uh, we were paid was only for the work that was done at Vanderbilt and not for any of the work done at McMurray. Ahora, allí aparecen los, ya les enviamos a ustedes también uh, todos esos datos y queremos decirles que yo me he sentido muy abusado, humillado y burlado porque esta situación aún no, no se ha resuelto. So I imagine that Orion has shared these, uh, um, the, these figures with everybody here, um, but I just want to say personally, I feel abused, I feel humiliated, and I feel, feel made fun of um, by the way we've been treated in this process. En una ocasión cuando estuvimos en Vanderbilt, eh, se nos había amenazado que no podíamos pisar las instalaciones porque le iban a hablar a la policía. Y gracias a los estudiantes de Vanderbilt, fue como pudimos volver a, a entrar a Vanderbilt y poder hablar del caso con Malcolm Pérez y la gente de ahí. We were trying to resolve the wage theft problem at Vanderbilt. Um, all we got was being threatened that if we stepped foot on the property, um, that we would be, uh, the police would be called, we'd be arrested. And thanks to the students at Vanderbilt Divinity School and others, um, we were able to get the attention of the administration and of the procurement officer, Michael Perez, to have a meeting with Orion and others to get the problem of wage theft there fixed. Cuando resolvimos el problema de la can las cantidades que ellos nos debían y finalmente logramos por la ayuda de Michael Perez que Orayo nos pagara la cantidad restante de 66 mil dólares, estuvimos en la oficina de Orion y yo personalmente y un estudiante de Vanderbilt le preguntamos a Jazz de, yo, de Orion que si él podía resolver de una buena vez lo de McMurray también. 
Um, when we fixed the problem there uh, of not being um, paid, of finally getting our $66,000 in claims paid with the support and help of uh, Michael Perez, um, we went to the office of Orion, uh, myself and a Vanderbilt student, and um, Mr. Josh from Orion, um, I asked, well, why can't we just resolve all of the claims here? Y él, yo siento que hasta con burla solo dijo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so la during our last meeting, we allowed a little bit of leeway for the, the interpretation. Um, so, but, uh, so I'm going to be a little flexible, but but I think, yeah, but I think we should probably cut it off. Entonces, um, le dijimos que si podía resolver la situación de McMurray y, y él, como en tono de burla, dijo, no puedo, y le dijimos que íbamos a seguir entonces con esto, y él, en tono de burla, dijo, está bien, les deseo suerte. So, um, just to finish, uh, when I asked Josh, Mr. Josh from Orion, when we were there um, getting the $66,000 we owed for the work at Vanderbilt, um, I asked him, well, why can't we, can we just sit down and resolve the issue with the money at, with McMurray too? And he just, uh, you know, making fun of me, was like, no. And then um, I said, well, well, you know, we're going to continue, you know, fighting for the money that, that we're owed. And he said, again, just making fun of me, in a tone making fun of me, said, well, good luck with that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Merry thank you. Day. All right, Ar Armando Arzate Jr. Again, if you can try to stick within that three minutes, it would be helpful, but I will allow a little bit of leeway. Okay. Uh, buenas noches a todos. Good evening, everybody. Este, estoy aquí por mi papá para. ¿Dónde tienes que dejar el audio? Sucar. ¿Cómo? ¿Dónde tienes que dejar el audio? Así como inventa algo con él porque me dice él. A decir muchas cosas. Okay. Yeah, Yo soy so nervioso. No, yeah, está bien. Este, estoy aquí por mi papá. Este, en tiempo de frío nosotros no, no podemos trabajar mucho, entonces. Estamos muy escasos de dinero y no podemos pagar la renta, los biles, a causa de que ellos no nos han pagado. Tuvimos que invertir nuestro dinero guardado. So, um, I'm here supporting my father. Um, now that it's started to get to the cold season, there's less work. And because we're still owed the money um, from uh, the previous, that, that we haven't been paid, we're not able to pay the rent, we're not able to pay the bills. Y este... En, en tiempos de, de frío, no podemos trabajar mucho nosotros por el clima. Entonces, no tenemos el dinero suficiente para soportarnos el resto del año. So, in, in, when it gets cold out, um, you know, we have a lot less work. And now we can't support ourselves now that we've entered into the, um, uh, the kind of the cold season. Uh, because we haven't been paid and we don't have money. So, necesitamos de su ayuda, por favor, a que a que hagan todo su esfuerzo para que ellos nos nos puedan pagar a nosotros, porque mm, lo necesitamos, vaya, no. So, we need your help to do everything in your power to ensure that uh, that we're paid what what we're owed. Gracias por su atención y por favor hagan todo lo posible. Thank you for your attention, and um, please do everything that you can um, for us. Thank you, and good evening. Thank you. Rafael Medina. Hola, muchas gracias por dejar que vengamos aquí ante ustedes con nuestro problema y, y yo sé bien que ustedes tratan de ayudarnos. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, come before you um, to talk about our problem and we know that you have done, um, you've already taken steps to try to help us. Y como decía mi primo, este, todos los números de que Orion ha hablado con ustedes y ha presentado era específicamente de uh, vender bio, que es lo que dijo Mr. Michael Pérez. 
And as my cousin um, Armando said, all of the numbers or the amounts that Orion has presented you and that they've talked about were amounts that were paid for the work that we performed at Vanderbilt and that we discussed with Mr. Michael uh, Perez. Y este, como dijo mi primo, cuando nos pagaron los 66 mil de Vanderbilt, este, allí antes de firmar el cheque y firmar todo, le dijimos a Mr. Josh que si que ese nada más era de Vanderbilt y dijo sí, eso nada más es de Vanderbilt. And um, as my uh, cousin said, before we got the check, the sixty-six thousand uh, dollars paid, we asked specifically. This is for the uh, this is for the work that we performed at Vanderbilt, and uh, Mr. Josh of uh, of Orion said yes. He confirmed what we'd already discussed. Y este hace como unas cinco semanas, este way de Joe Hash. He called me, él me habló y me dijo que, que este, nada más nos debía 1,250. ¿Cuánto? 1,250. 1,250. Yeah. So five weeks ago, uh, Wade from Joe Haas just called me out of the blue and said, well, we only owe you 1,250. Y este, me dijo que había un contrato de mí, de Armando, que ya nos había pagado los dos trabajos y que eh, Josh y Orion sabían de ese contrato. He had said that there was some contract between myself and, um, and Armando um, that, uh, we had, uh, that we had and that Orion, Orion ya pagó? Sí, que ya and había pagado de los dos. Uh, and that Orion had paid, how was that? The, the two jobs. Uh -huh. Orion pagó, uh, paid for those two jobs. Y entonces yo, col, yo le hablé a Mr. Josh y le pregunté de ese contrato y me dijo, no, dice, ese nomás era exclusivamente de vender bio. Buena suerte para que hagan lo que puedan hacer para que les paguen del otro. So I called Mr. Josh from Orion and I said, and to, to ask him, you know, what, what is this that I'm getting this call from Wade about? And he said, no, no, yeah, the, that, that was a separate uh, agreement between us, between Orion in RSA, it didn't have anything to do with that, and, and good luck with your getting your pay um, for the work at McMurray. Eso es todo. Muchas gracias. That's all. Thank you. Okay, Carlos Aquino. <coughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> solo estoy aquí para traducir. Okay. Buenas noches a todos. Hoy, Good evening, everybody. Hoy esta es la segunda vez que vengo. Hubo la tercera, pero yo no pude venir porque yo tengo familia y pues a veces hay que llevar a los niños a la escuela y eso. Y no pude venir la otra vez. Yo le estuve pidiendo disculpas al patrón. Voy a decirle, dije, ¿sabes qué? No puedo estar yendo seguido porque tengo familia. Y, y él dijo, no, ya no va a ser mucho más. Hay que seguir porque si no, no nos pagan. Y yo, bueno, pues vamos a seguir entonces, pero a veces no puede venir uno, ¿verdad? Por los chamacos de la escuela y pues, pero bueno, vamos a seguir adelante. Oh, this is the second time I come in front of you. Um, you know, I've, uh, there have been other things that we've been doing um, to, to uh, resolve this issue of the wage theft at McMurray, but, uh, you know, I have family, so I can't always make it. Um, you know, I've got, I got kids. So I do what I can, but um, you know when Armando called me and he's like, "Look, this still isn't resolved." I said, "Well, we got to keep moving forward," and so um, I came. But you know, I can't. It's difficult for me to always be coming out here trying to um, address this because you know I have family I have to take care of too. Yo, ¿cómo se llama? Pues yo pienso que que deberíamos ahora sí seguir adelante porque la verdad pues ya estamos aquí, verdad, y pues si ustedes también tienen aquí están también. Y pues, ojalá que nos paguen, ¿verdad? Que les paguen a ellos, porque la verdad a mí ya me pagaron ellos. Que les paguen a ellos, porque a mí ya me pagaron. Y pues, esperemos que, que les paguen, ¿verdad? 
Uh, but I think we have to go forward, and I, hopefully, um, you know, you can urge uh, them to do the right thing, and hopefully, um, RSA gets paid. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, they pay. I'm an, an employee of RSA. They paid me, but they haven't been paid, and um, you know, hopefully, that can get fixed. A veces, cuando estábamos trabajando, yo le preguntaba al mando, oye, al mando, ¿y esta gente se está pagando? No, que cuando terminen el trabajo uno, nos van a pagar todo. Digo, bueno, está bien, ¿verdad? Se, se terminó el trabajo y le volví a preguntar a Armando, ¿Armando sí pagaron? No, que eh, sí van a pagar, pero empiecen otro trabajo. Pero, ¿cómo digo? Comenzar uno y pagar otro, como, no está muy bien, pues. La verdad no está bien que paguen uno y luego comenzar otro. Yo le dije a él que si ellos hacían eso, yo no iba a trabajar para ellos. Porque digo, ¿cómo va a ser que paguen un trabajo y van a comenzar otro de ese trabajo? Y van a pagar otro trabajo. Está bien, pues. So sometimes when we've been working, you know, I ask Armando, like, because like, he's paying, you know, I'm getting paid. Um, are you getting paid for the work that's, that, that's being done? And um, he's like, well, we're supposed to get paid soon. Yeah, it's going to happen soon. And then we get, you know, we, we continue. We go to another work site, the same thing. Um, and that's not good. It's not good that, uh, you know, that he keeps doing the right thing, um, that uh, my employer's doing the right thing, and still not getting paid for the work that, that he did. Eso es el tiempo. Bueno, pues yo, Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Catarino Hernandez. Oh, you can just take it out of the. Yeah, yeah, Sonia. Buenas noches. Good evening. We're here asking for help to pay the payment lo que le deben a ellos, a mis patrones. We're here again um, to ask you um, to help to um, that, uh, you know, my boss, uh, bosses get paid for the <coughs> work that we did. Ellos sí nos han pagado, pero a ellos no, no los quieren pagar y pedimos su ayuda para que los paguen. They paid all of us as workers, um, but they still haven't been paid. And so we're asking for your support. Um, that they get paid for the work that, that uh, we already completed. Gracias. Thank you. Manuel Marquez. Buenas noches. Good evening. Vengo aquí para ayudar a a mi patrón también para que exigirles que pues sí ya les paguen a ellos porque sí sí este se, se, se necesita el dinero para, para todo y, y este pues a eso vinimos a ayudarlo a apoyarlo I'm here, todo, okay. um, I'm here to uh, support my employer and I ask that uh, you do what you can to ensure that uh, they get paid um, they made sure that we were paid for the work that was done but they need, they, they need the money, right? It's, uh, um, it's obvious that they need the money for the work that they did. Muchas gracias y feliz Navidad para todos. Thank you and a Merry Christmas to everybody. Jaime Marquez. Buenas noches nuevamente. Mi nombre es Jaime Marquez. Uh, good evening again. My name is Jaime Marquez. Soy uno de los trabajadores de Rafael y, y este, Armando. I'm one of the workers of Armando and Rafael. Uh, este, bueno, venimos a apoyarlos a ellos y a pedirle a ustedes, por favor, que nos ayuden. Um, we came here to support them and to ask that you support, uh, support, them, as, support them as well. Ellos, a nosotros, este, gracias a Dios, sí nos pagaron. No sabemos cómo lo hicieron ellos. Eh, pero, pues, desgraciadamente, ellos no les han pagado. Y, y venimos a apoyarlos y a pedirles a ustedes, por favor, su ayuda. Thank, uh, they paid us. Thank God they paid us. I don't know how they did it. Um, and we're asking for your support to ensure that, uh, you know, they get paid and, uh, and your help to make sure that they get paid. Uh, 
Uh, gracias por su atención, por su tiempo. Y feliz Navidad. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your time. And uh, Merry Christmas. Thank you. Eduardo, Eduardo Galán. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Good evening, everybody. Uh, seré breve con las palabras, pero concisas. Um, I'm going to be brief, but concise. OK. Um, el principal problema aquí es um, el tema de um, los derechos que tenemos todos como personas. The main problem we have here is a question of the rights that we all have as people. Y um, eh, la necesidad que tenemos todos de eh, trabajar y de ser eh, recompensados, de alguna forma decirlo, por nuestro trabajo. And the need that we all have to work and be paid for the work that we did. Um, queremos eh, pedir su colaboración como trabajadores que ustedes también son para que se pongan el, en nuestros zapatos y nos eh, ayuden en este caso que tenemos, este inconveniente que tenemos hoy. We ask for your support um, as fellow workers and to put yourself in our shoes um, and what it feels like to be on our side of this um, and do what you can to make sure that, uh, that what's, uh, what's right is done. Okay. Um, feliz Navidad para todos. Muchas gracias y espero su colaboración. Um, Merry Christmas to everybody. Um, thank you for your time. And uh, we're asking for, for your active support in helping uh, fix this. Thank you. Jack Wiley. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I feel like I've had to talk a lot. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Dr. Battle and uh, everybody on the school board, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for taking the step um, of, of ensuring there's going to be a meeting on Monday uh, with all the parties involved. Um, Oh, by the way, Jack Willie, 97J Street um, in uh, the Woodbine neighborhood. Um, we did bring this to the attention of the administration in June. It's been a lot of months. And um, unfortunately, it's gotten to this point in spite of a lot of attempts to try to resolve this um, between with MNPS, with Orion, with Joe Haas, and um, and really trying to do everything possible privately before having to, to come out and, and be public. Um, I feel like it's a real stain on uh, the school district that my son is part of. Um, and especially in a school district where teachers and paraprofessionals and everybody is working so hard to educate our kids, um, that we have this situation where really an abuse of power um, and that is affecting people's lives uh, deeply was allowed to happen. Um, and not only just allowed to happen, but just ongoing silence and foot dragging um, to get to this point. From the beginning in June, all we asked for um, from the administration was a meeting of all the parties involved. Um, we got that, but it's required coming here twice going to McMurray Middle School and talking with teachers and students and others to bring this attention, bring the, uh, this to their attention. Um, and, uh, it, and also the, the proof that this already happened once at Vanderbilt University with the exact same general contractor and subcontractor um, that, uh, that we have to be here. But now that we are, uh, I would like to address um, one of the things that was raised. We do need to have a surety bond or other type of setup that's transparent, that's simple, that's accessible, and that's given to every single contractor and subcontractor on jobs at MNPS. If it's going to be something that can actually be used by the people who are victims of this type of abuse, it has to be easy and it has to be accessible. That's not the case right now. Something's got to be changed in the way that it's done. Um, please make these changes to have some transparency because um, I mean, this is, uh, uh, it's a real shame that, that people are, may go without uh, a Christmas. They've already had to pawn their, 
uh, their trucks and borrow money from family to make ends meet. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Bobby Negron. Good evening. Um, Bobby Negron, 97 J Street. Thank you so much for taking the time to hear what we had to say today. I had to sit down and really think about what I was going to say, and as I sat down, all I could think about was my son's lunch balance at school. We went a few weeks forgetting to pay his lunch balance, or we tried online and we couldn't use the online program. But even though we forgot, we knew that our son would not go hungry at school, and the cafeteria ladies, which are mostly ladies, I don't mean to be sexist, <laughs> um, would still put, foot on, put food on his tray. I knew that even though I made the mistake of forgetting to pay the balance, my son would not be denied food or be humiliated. But I felt terrible every time I received a notice or a call about my son's uh, lunch balance. I know where that money goes towards, filling the pantries, paying the workers, paying the gas electric for the kitchen appliances, but every time those ladies fed my son. What an example of unconditional love for other people's children. Similar is Armando's story. Not so much feeding students and staff, but the labor of love that he and the other workers behind me to create the space environment to keep their children safe and comfortable at Metro schools. He did the labor just like the workers at the cafeteria each day. And shouldn't they be paid? My son's balance is filled up now with an extra cushion because I did the right thing. I see every job at MNPS as dignified and workers should be paid their worth. Why can't we hold Orion, a million dollar company, to the same accountabilities as parents? Why is it that it is always workers who make doubly sacrifices just to have crumbs by the bosses? Isn't it time workers receive the whole darn gosh pie? Do the right thing, please. Be an example. Pay Armando, the other workers behind me. Show compassion before the holidays. Thank you. Rachel Turns. Good evening. I'm Rachel Turness, and I live at 2207 Hermosa Street. I'm one of the Vanderbilt Divinity students um, who walked with Armando and Rafael um, of RSA last summer through their fight for their claimed wages for the work they did at Vanderbilt. I'm a person who ideally wants to believe the best about everyone and who believes in respect and ethical conduct. The more I interacted with the leadership of both Orion and Joe Haas, the more disturbed I became. I'm going to try to paint a picture of the character of the companies that Metro Nashville Public Schools currently does business with. Wade Rawson, the site supervisor employed by Joe Haas, failed or refused to provide Armando and Raphael with written contracts reflecting their verbal agreement for work and payment on both work sites, despite them requesting a written contract multiple times early on. Mr. Rawson made many conflicting excuses as to why he hadn't paid the workers fully. When the Vanderbilt job was complete, Mr. Rawson threatened that he would call the police on Armando if he saw him on Vanderbilt property. This would be completely outside of Mr. Rawson's right, but he was afraid of Armando talking to Vanderbilt students and administrators about what was going on. In the meeting with RSA and six Orion and Joe Haas reps, Orion and Joe Haas both defended Mr. Rawson and maintained that they weren't aware of any problems until recently. Over the course of the meeting, as Mr. Rawson's story changed and details conflicted or were missing, it became more and more clear to everyone that Mr. Rawson had either egregiously failed to document his business with the workers or that he was lying to everyone, including um, Orion and Joe Haas reps. The Orion and Joe Haas reps became more and more uncomfortable. Orion's VP, Josh Gill, seemed to slip up and acknowledged that he had known early on that Mr. Rawson was withholding payment. Instead of taking responsibility for the harm that they knew was caused by their incompetent and dishonest subcontractor, Orion refused to back down and instead pressured RSA to compromise on their amount claimed. They only finally agreed to pay when Vanderbilt impressed upon them how much of an embarrassment it would be on the school and the business relationship if the opening event happened without a resolution. When we went to pick up the check from Orion, one of their execs said outright to me that it was clear to him that Mr. Rawson was lying to everyone and cheating the workers. 
They know they were wrong. They know that RSA has been the only party in the situation that has stuck to their account throughout, that has been able to provide any kind of documentation, and that has not report, resorted to smears and lies. But they still won't do anything about the wages that Armando and Rafael claim for their work on McMurray Middle School. We're grateful that you've been talking to Ryan this week, and I wanted you to know who you're working with. Please don't ask that Armando and Rafael to accept any less than what they've earned. If anything, having been put through such hardship emotionally and financially, they should be paid more. Thank you for your time. Molly Williams. Hi, my name is Molly Williams and my address is 2804 Belmont Boulevard. I'm going to read some letters from MNPS students. Hi, my name is Violeta Rodriguez and I'm a student from Apollo Middle School. I just want to say that it's not fair for Armando Arzate to not get paid for his great work and his effort and all the days and time he spent doing that work. They told him to do the work and now they don't want to pay him. He did all of that work to make the school better than it was. How would you feel if this was happening to you? He needs to get paid. Hello, my name is Valeria. And I think it is not fair that Mr. Armando is not paid for his great work and his effort so that the, that the school is better than before. Think about this. You would not like that to happen to you, and I think that he needs to get paid for his work. I think Armando should get paid because he has kids to take care of. He wasted a lot of time building. Instead of building for you guys, he could have been working for someone else and get paid for it. You guys wasted his time building for nothing. <coughs> I have a question. How can people sleep at night? Don't people feel bad? He should get paid because that's his job. That's how he makes money, to pay his bills. It's not fair. What if that happened to you? What would your reaction be? I think he should be paid. He deserves it. Hello, my name is Noor. I think it's not fair for Armando not to get paid for the work he did. Like he wasted all his time and energy on nothing. Hopefully he gets paid for his credit. I honestly feel super bad for this man. He deserves all the money he worked for. MNPS board, please listen to our students. Thank you for everything you do for our schools. Thank you, thank you for taking these claims seriously and for setting up a meeting. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Andrew Ricard. Good evening, Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Battle. My name is Andrew Record, and I live at 2804 Belmont Boulevard. I teach eighth grade English learners at Apollo Middle School, just a few, mi a few miles from McMurray. And first, as a side note, I want to thank Elizabeth Hines, who I don't think is here anymore, um, for sharing her story about the drug search the police inflicted on her and her students. Uh, and I want to add that at Apollo, I see this happen about once a month. Okay, so last, night, er, la last month, I got up behind this mic and I told you that our students are watching you. They're watching to inform their ideas of what's right and what's normal. Well, it's been a month since that last meeting a month since many of you said, spoke out publicly in support of the workers. But what do the McMurray workers have to show for it? Nothing, yet. Tonight we've already heard students witness what they're seeing from you. Members of the board, you might not have direct control over the contracts in the district, but the people of this city have given you tremendous power and we also put our trust in you to do right. So why has it been since June that we've been raising this issue to you, calling you, emailing you, leaving voicemails, and here we are in December in more or less the same situation? You say you want justice. You say you want the people who build our schools to be paid. And we're thankful to those of you who have said those things. Those are easy things to say. What are you doing? Dr. Battle, I want to believe that you want to do the right thing and that you mean what you said when you told a room full of teachers 
It's important for us that if we do business with others, that we ensure they follow their obligations as well. But the fact of the matter is, you have the power to fix the situation yesterday, and we're still here. You knew your workers were being stolen from in June. And the reason that you are now trying to facilitate a productive path forward is because of all of us here in the back of the room last month and again tonight. We appreciate that you say you are taking steps to hold your contractors to higher standards in the future. But for Armando and the workers you've heard from tonight, <coughs> these steps are too little, too late. How much longer will we wait <coughs> until you make it right for them? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Kellyanne Graff. Hi, good evening. My name is Kellyanne Graff, and I am an instructional assistant at McMurray Middle School. I work with eighth grade ELA. And every day at McMurray, we ask our students to soar. Our mascot is this falcons. And for us, soaring means showing respect, owning my behavior, always being safe, and ready to do my best. And I'm here today to ask you to do that and to push your contractors and subcontractors to do the same. If my eighth graders can do it, I'm sure that adults can meet these standards, these expectations as well. I want you to show respect to these workers, show the decency to stand on the side of justice. I want you to own the behavior. I want you to hold the people you associate with accountable and not to be complicit in this injustice and this theft. I want you to be safe in moving forward, using surety bonds to guarantee that the <coughs> workers are paid, that you are not smeared either. This is mutually beneficial to protect our workers and to protect Metro Nashville Public Schools' reputation. And I want you to be ready to do your best, to be punctual, to move quickly with this, to move forward and swiftly for justice. <coughs> it's a really personal issue for a lot of my students as their parents work in construction, as their parents are day laborers. They see, they've talked to me about it at lunch, the discrimination that their parents face, how their parents are exploited because they may not speak English. And I wish my students could be here today, but there's a home game, a home basketball game. Our girls team is undefeated right now. And I wish I could be cheering on my students instead of fighting here for our workers to get paid. It is a beautiful school. It is a beautiful place to work full of beautiful students. And I want them to know that it is a just place. We talk about justice. We talk about liberation. The MNPS scope and sequence focuses on these ideas of justice and identity, and I want them to be existing in a system that also supports those identities and also supports justice. And you have the power to do that. You have the power to fight for these students and fight for what we are teaching them. Thank you so much. Thank you. James Robinson. Good evening. My name is James Robinson. Five years ago, I was the founding principal at Rocketship United Academy. Currently, I am the director of schools for Rocketship Public Schools in Nashville, Tennessee. On September 24th, the Office of Charter Schools presented to you its recommendation that Rocketship be granted permission to open a third school in Southeast Nashville. The board voted it down, so we appealed to the state. On November 15th, the State Board of Education unanimously voted to approve a charter for Rockshire Public Schools' third school in Nashville. As an organization, we are grateful for this decision. Furthermore, we are grateful to the State Board of Education for validating the recommendation from the MNPS Office of Charter Schools. Both recommendations cite confidence in our plan and successful record for serving disadvantaged communities. We know that a new public school is going to open in Southeast Nashville, no matter what. That said, we do have pride in being part of the Nashville public charter school community, which is comprised of some of the best schools in the country. 
The board ought to be proud of this work. It's truly outstanding. While we do have more work to do, we feel that it's best done together with MNPS. And we truly do want to collaborate, and we have some evidence of collaboration that we feel benefits students in MNPS and Iraq Ship Public Schools and all schools. For example, Emma Volpe and Lee Center from Rock Ship United Academy, they are both serve on the EL Council for MNPS. This council works to ensure that all EL learners receive a great education. The council selects one problem to work for for one year. This year, the focus is on newcomers, which we know is a big need in, in Southeast Nashville. We are excited to share our insights for this work and perspectives, and we really want to be collaborative on helping solve this problem. We want to continue to grow our partnership with MMPS, and we have an opportunity to do that tonight. When you vote on Rocket Ship 3 tonight, you're voting for the following. To add a high quality public school to the MMPS portfolio in Southeast Nashville. <coughs> to decrease overcrowding in Southeast Nashville schools. To have more local control and more opportunities for collaboration. And financially, MMPS can collect more authorization fees. We've recently hosted tours with board members on, some of our, on two of our campuses. Board members, all of you have been very generous with your time, and our students have even written letters to, to all of you asking for you to visit. I hope each of you will accept the, our students' offers. One thing that is, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Abby Spaulding. Hi, good evening. My name is Abby Spaulding. I'm a native Nashvillian and I'm the current board chair of Rocket Ship Nashville. I'm here to dovetail and uh, pick up where James left off. While our national board is a governing board consistent with Tennessee law, our local board was formed in recent years specifically to provide guidance and support at the local level for our community leaders of, of within our Nashville schools. As board chair, I also have a seat on the national board to make sure an informed decision on what's beneficial or not for our schools here locally. I share that to say that rocket ship schools here are led and managed by Nashvillians. We are doing this work because we know the critical impact of public education and our, on our local families and our community. We feel a sense of urgency to offer our families, especially those in historically disadvantaged communities, the opportunity to attend a public school that would help them reach their full potential. We understand the governance, governance responsibilities of a board to make decisions that will have positive outcomes and operational health for our organization. Looking at the decision before you tonight, this is not a vote on whether or not our third rocket, rocket ship school will open, but how it will open. Tonight's decision will be determined on if you agree that there are benefits in allowing rocket ship to open in partnership with the district. For MNPS, authorizing this school will allow you the ability to capture both our authorization fee and our achievement data which has especially been strong for the disadvantaged student subgroups. But more importantly, supervising our entire local network would also give the district more insight and control over our accountability. For Rocket Ship, having one authorizer allows our staff to streamline administrative and management tasks, leaving more time to focus on the real work at hand, which is teaching and learning. Our staff have a strong working relationship with MNPS Office of Charter Schools, and we'd like to continue that partnership. Most importantly, to me, the decision boils down very succinctly if, if you want <coughs> oversight over your students in our network. This vote is coming before you tonight in order to meet the state's deadline for the decision. We'd appreciate your thoughtful consideration and request that you would vote yes tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Amanda Kale. Good evening, uh, my name is Amanda Kale. I'm president of MNEA, uh, also an MNPS teacher. Um, I'm here tonight, first of all, to, um, <coughs> as a happy night uh, for MNEA. We have one, we have enough votes at this point to move forward with collaborative conferencing, which is very exciting for us in MNEA. That gives us an avenue, the state gives us an avenue to negotiate um, better uh, compensation, working conditions, all the things that are really, really important to us. Um, so that is a happy thing. 
I'm also here tonight with the workers who are standing behind me um, and with workers' dignity because they do not have that venue. They do not have a way to negotiate those things except for this, except for us to stand together. We appreciate very much um, the work that you all are doing to move this towards a resolution. But again, as MNEA, as teachers, we're going to continue to stand with uh, Armando and Workers' Dignity to ask that these people be paid. Because as I said last time, we have to all work together. Um, when I look at the workers behind me, I see the families that I serve. I see my students. And we have to work to make this city a fairer place, a better place. And we can do that together. We have that power. We can actually turn this around. And what a joy it is to have that opportunity, to have that power to actually make something right. And so I will continue to stand with them. I will continue to push, as will MNEA, um, to make sure that Armando and uh, his fellow workers get paid. Thank you, and have a good evening. All right, so that concludes public participation, and I will now entertain a motion on our consent agenda. I move to uh, approve the consent agenda as printed. Second. All right, um, vote. All in favor of the motion? <coughs> okay, that's a unanimous vote. And so we will now move to rocket ship, uh, Nashville number three appeal. Um, I'm gonna call Corey Harkey up, our attorney, and she is going to explain to us the procedure for the appeal and the pros and cons of um, local governance versus state governance. It'll be a pretty general uh, kind of discussion, <laughs> but our general presentation. But I have been asked to provide a brief opening as to the purpose of the rocket ship number three, again being on the board's agenda for a decision this evening. As you recall, rocket ship three submitted an application for a new charter school, and through the statutorily outlined and charter authorizing process, the board, MPS board, denied that uh, back in September of 2019. After an appeal to the State Board of Education by rocket ship as authorized under the statute, the State Board of Education has overturned the MNPS's board's denial of the application. This, such a denial usually results in the State Board acting as the LEA for the newly approved charter school. Um, however, Tennessee Code 4913-142 specifically <coughs> provides that a charter school authorized by the State Board and the LEA in which the charter school is located may, within 30 calendar days <coughs> of such authorization, mutually agree that the charter school shall be overseen and monitored by the LEA. Rocket ship, ship number three has made a request to be overseen and monitored by MNPS as the LEA, and therefore tonight on your agenda, you are being asked to decide whether to allow the newly created rocket ship number three to be under MNPS as the LEA. If the again, if the board decides not to have rocket ship under its purview, uh, rocket ship will still open. It will just be um, under the state as the LEA. Uh, in deciding whether to operate, I'm going to give some very, very general things to consider. Um, and in fact, I mean, I think you've heard a few uh, uh, position statements in terms of some of the things that you would might want to consider. But pursuant to the state statute, uh, performance of the rocket ship will be attributable to the LEA. So whether that is us or the state, their performance, whoever that LEA will will have will, will be. Um, representing their stats, their, their performance, um, good or bad. The, the LEA is also responsible for the oversight, monitoring, and ultimate control of uh, chartering decisions for the charter school. So again, whether you want to have that control or not. The LEA receives the authorizer fee for the charter school, but is also responsible for the oversight and support of the school. So additional supports that we provide to all of our, our district-run schools would be available for, for the charter school as well. And then, of course, all the money, including federal, local, and BEP funds, follow the students. Um, so that, the, that money will, will follow the students wherever they are. Um, with that, unless there are questions, I'm going to turn it over to the board so you all can decide whether or not uh, MNPS wants to act as the LEA for rocket ship number three. Yes, would you like to make a motion? Or do you want to ask questions? Ask Go ahead. Questions. Go ahead. Um, for when the charter is renewed, um, if is the LEA so if 
if the state is the LEA for rockership and it's our charters for renewal, are they the um, authorizer of the renewal? And such the same with us, if we are the author, if we are the LEA for rocket ship, is again for renewal, we will be the renewal? Correct. Okay. Uh, whoever the LEA would have the ultimate authority, they would act as the LEA. And so any renewal or any decision making would, would come to this board for approval or denial first. I have a question. Or so I originally pulled this or asked this to be added to the agenda because I wanted us to be able to have a discussion. I'll be honest, I, I don't really know where I stand yet. I mean, I see pros and cons on both sides, so I'm willing to listen to what, whoever wants to make a motion. Um, but I do think it's important that we explain to the community what's happening and where, you know, how students will be impacted. And I just don't think it should be one person's vote, so I ask that it be added to our agenda so we could discuss it. So. What what is the authorization fee? I, I remember it was something like three percent or two percent of is it yes. of the entire student based budget? Is it three percent of? I can't remember the exact. It's thirty five thousand. Thirty five thousand, or right, that's the cap. That's the the three percent or thirty five. We get thirty five thousand. I don't, the, it's spelled out in the statute. I can certainly try to pull it up quickly. It sounds like we're thinking that rocket ship would be a thirty five thousand dollar cap. Yeah. So okay, and this is an elementary school. Do you remember the number of students? I don't remember the charter. I'm sorry. Like 400, 485, and it sounds like it is an elementary school. I just wish we would I'm have had this on Thursday to be able to pull yeah. and ask questions because I just think there's there are more questions I want to know about what how much do we spend on supporting schools versus how much would that authorization fee you know, assist our students. And then I do want us to remember that at the end of the day, no matter what the school name is, that these are Nashville students, and we do want to be supporting our families and our students and our constituents and our community as much as best we can. So that's what I say. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm open to emotion. I just think that we need to be mindful of not really ideological stances, but really what does this do for MMPS? What does it do for Nashville students? And then, you know, do the pros outweigh the cons of, um, and I hate to use that terminology, but you know, is it, should we take them on because we can monitor and because they are part of Nashville or do we not because the state took this so the state should have to deal with it, but again, it's, it's Nashville students. So my thoughts, ta-da. Would someone like to make a motion? Okay. Ms. Bush would like to make a comment. Um, where is this going? Um, do y'all have a location yet? Because I know it's going to go in Southeast Davis. And that's in my <coughs> district, right? <coughs> my district. Can you tell me where the location is going to be? <coughs> you said Alf Bell Road. Do you know kind of where Alf Bell Road? Just give me like a pinpoint. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, here's the thing. We all know what happened to Knowledge Academies, okay? No oversight, nothing that I could control at the time of the situation that happened with knowledge. And we're still dealing with knowledge, which I haven't even gotten uh, any information on the probation for Knowledge Academy. So hopefully Dennis should be getting that to me soon. It'll be finalized next week. Okay. So it's important that it's going to happen, okay? It's going to happen. Um, it's going to be more that's going to uh, go on Southeast Davis. And I said that last month. So um, I would support uh, the oversight only because it is the right thing to do so I can walk in that school and see what's going on and I can get, be more proactive um, than instead of being reactive when all these things, you know, happen, like knowledge. So that's my thought. And I'm not going through another Knowledge Academy, so this is what um, I feel that would be necessary so that we can oversight this particular um, school. Um, so that's my thoughts about it. That's going in Southeast Davidson County. Um, again, I need more schools. Not that this is, the, the, this is the perfect school. I'm not saying that at all. But I have been begging for schools to, I, I need schools. I need schools. I need schools. Mr. Prophet, yeah, you see? So this is why I'm being put in this situation, 
because I need schools and children need and parents want options. So it puts me, put, puts my back against the wall to say, okay, what are we gonna do? Southeast Davidson County is the fastest growing uh, area in this district. And yet, we're slow to move building our schools. So this is why we're here now. So oversight is what we need to do. We need to continue to do this with our charter schools. Uh, again, we dropped the ball with knowledge. So shame on us on that one, but it won't happen again. So that's my thoughts. Okay, any more comments? Elrod? Are we supposed to be making comments now or have a motion? We can have the motion and have discussion, or if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, that's fine. Do you want to go ahead with the motion? Okay. Does someone like to make a motion? I'm, I will make a motion. Okay. I would like to make the motion that we deny rocket ship. Um, and I'm not sure how to end that. I'm so sorry. I've not done this before. But my motion is to deny the rocket ship application. Second. Okay. Discussion. Ms. Velrod. Okay. So uh, my reasonings for that, um, I'll start with the conversation about oversight. So uh, we had local oversight in your specific example, and yet we are where we are, as you pointed out. So I don't feel like the local oversight is an argument towards it, as we still have um, a difficult time with local, local oversight in our charter schools. Um, and so that's why I would disagree with the need for local oversight, because it, it didn't make a, a difference in your specific example. Um, additionally, my concern is that the authorization fee does not offset the cost of having this charter school. Um, I would like to echo my colleague, uh, Bugs, um, of, once again, I would really like us to have the information in advance, and I, I don't know why we didn't. Um, that's a conversation for us to all have later as maybe a board. But once again, I think it's important that we have those numbers so that we can make appropriate and fair answers. Um, we're not just making them up out of thin air of how much we think it's gonna cost. So I appreciate that we found out that the authorization fee is $35,000 or that 3%, we hit that max. Um, but I would not think that we are um, uh, netting a profit of any kind or having any, we are definitely spending more than that on that school. And I don't disagree that we need schools in Southeast Nashville. I mean, my district is in South Southeast Nashville as well. Um, so we do need schools, but we also need money. Um, and that's the reason why we need schools. So that, those are my main concerns, but I am interested in entertaining and hearing what everybody else's opinions are as well. Bugs and then Ms. Pippa Walker. All right. So for, Mr. Queen, I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, and I do need to, for the viewing public, to let you know that this was not an administration error. It's not that we asked for something and didn't get it. This was purely on the part of the board. It's like we let the time roll out, and then we just didn't ask you, and that's that's our fault. So just, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like hanging out our administration to dry. But I hate to put you on the spot. Do you, is there any way that you could speak to any financial or fiscal impact the $35,000? Um, I know it's not a lot, but I mean, uh, just anything you have to say regarding. Well, I would say that the amount of money that the district spends doing the work of charters far exceeds uh, what we uh, get through the authorization fee. We probably spend, and we're in the process of uh, filling out uh, uh, what we call PAR forms uh, to keep a record of the amount of time we spend, but we've guesstimated probably over $4 million uh, that the district invests through all the various departments, including our office and uh, staffing. Um, we collect uh, right now just under a million dollars with the 28 charter schools that we have. So we're spending three plus million dollars potentially ab above and beyond what we're getting authorization. Gotcha. And then, well, you, you make a strong point fiscally then because then my other argument was that, you know, I still want us to kind of balance out the councilmatic respect to offer um, Mrs. Bush, but then to just keep thinking about the kids, but the fiscal impact is something to consider. So thank you for that. Mr. Queen, I have a couple of questions for you. So describe for us, I mean, this is a legitimate question. What is the difference between our relationship with the state-run ASD schools or state-run, like the Canoe Kip in South Nashville versus 
uh, the traditional charter schools that we oversee? We have almost no working relationship. Uh, the state board schools are uh, different LEAs. Uh, we probably have a better working relationship with ASD, uh, but even that is very limited due to them being a state, um, again, a state LEA uh, group of schools. Um, so we work very, uh, very loosely with them. So for example, if we have students coming back and forth between a, a state-run charter and us, we don't really have a mechanism to communicate with them about transferring student information or understanding situations that students might bring sure. with them. Not much different than if they were coming in from a different county in Tennessee. We would request records, those kinds of things. So then the relationship you have with traditional star charter schools, what are the types of engagements that you have with them on, the, on a regular basis? Uh, we certainly visit every school every month. Uh, we've tiered the schools into three tiers. Uh, we look at our practice sharing schools, our high-performing charter schools, which are tier one. Tier two are standard schools, they do okay. Tier three are schools that are in trouble. Uh, so the amount of time we spend in those schools depends on where they're tiered. Uh, we also invite them on the uh, principal's leadership uh, day. We have a collaborative uh, where we invite them in and they help co-develop agendas. Uh, we are on the phone with them every day. Uh, most of our schools are helping them with access, helping them to understand processes and procedures and things of that nature. So we work uh, very close with our MNPS LEA charter schools. Those that are not, we, it's very limited at what we do. And so how many schools would you say are in tier three right now? Five. Out of 28? Yes, ma'am. So the majority, the vast majority are either high performing or performing well. Correct, we just tiered based on our 2019 data and we have, uh, I believe it's 14 tier one schools, very high performing, low incident. Um, and then we have about five that are the tier three, the remaining are, are tier two schools which are successful, uh, but not highly successful, but yet they are exceeding. So how many schools have you guys helped move up from, say, Tier 3 to Tier 2? Does that happen? It, it does. It varies uh, from year to year based on uh, state assessment data. Uh, we actually dropped about three schools, I believe, uh, for 2020. Uh, but we also jumped up uh, probably four or five schools a year before that from a Tier 2 to a Tier 3. And the, the From a Tier 3 to a Tier 2? Uh, to, from Tier 2 to Tier 3. We, we had about 55% of our schools in Tier 1, high-performing. Yeah. Uh, for 2019, uh, but with the new assessment data, we brought three down as we reviewed their data and determined we needed to spend a little more time with them. Um, and so, um, do you have any sense of how much support the, the state gives, and is there any kind of comparison between what the state offers to their schools and what you guys offer? Only what I hear, and what I hear is that they, uh, they have so few schools and a very large staff, we're kind of opposite of small staff and large number of schools, uh, that they, they've they spent an, an enormous amount, a, a great deal more time in those schools. But they've got two, uh, three actually, I think one out of uh, Shelby County. So they're trying to support three schools, probably with a staff larger than ours. So if a, if a parent who's at a state-run charter school has a concern, they cannot come to you. You have no ability to help that family. Is correct. That correct. Correct. But, the, but if they were our charter school, you would have the ability to go in and address issues. We can support them. There is a process um, within charter schools, but yeah, we uh, I've dealt with one today. That's helpful. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any more comments? Okay, Miss Frida. Frida. <laughs> Player oh. Peters. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It takes, player, it takes a while. Player. <laughs> I've, had, I've had four years of practice. Yeah, okay. um, you know, we're, we're, I think we're at an interesting juncture just as local governments with state governments um, where we having a general issue where there are metro general government with us as a school board of preemption or I guess here it's um, authorizing local control that I think it's a conversation and a development that's happening that's progressing and that's very new and kind of uncharted ter territories. Um, I mean, part of the issue as being a local authority, um, whether you're on the Metro Council side, mayor side, or us as a school board of setting policies that we feel is good for Nashville um, and best for Nashville, where fiduciary, fiscal, philosophical, um, 
but then having it over, have it preempted or overridden or um, by the state and the state not always taking responsibility for their actions and then we have to have the responsibility. Um, and so it's, it's a difficult conversation ph philosophically because as uh, Ms. Bush said about, you know, being able to look, have a little control, but then also as a car part of you have proved it, this is your responsibility also. So this is kind of the, the back and forth that, you, that we go through of, of trying to figure out as we govern, it's, it's a little bit of, a, of an interesting position of always worrying about what your position is going to be, whether it's going to be preempted, is your, um, as an individual, as a, local, as a representative, but then also speaking as one voice as a body, is that decision going to be respected um, as authority figures? And it's kind of, a, kind of an interesting territory um, that we're in at this time. Um, and so, I mean, so it's, it's kind of a difficult part of being a part of having the financial responsibility, but not having the philosophical response, not having the, um, the political, I guess, responsibility, for lack of a better phrase at the moment, um, that we're going through. So, you know, with Ms. Bugs, I understand the difficulty of doing this and only having 30 days to really consider it. And that's the other part of the whole law. I mean, I think that's my biggest issue with this whole issue is that not having a full, um, time to do it because if we if we don't make action this at this meeting it goes into effect goes to the state automatically is that correct <coughs> okay um, and I think that's kind of also unfair just as they're saying trying to get information trying to process it trying to sort out um, how do you do this um, and what's fair to the children what's fair to the district what's fair fiscally um, to what we have to do as a budget because at the end of the day you know it's coming out of our budget um, and you know, the state's not taking full responsibility for that too. Um, and so I just want to kind of lay out the, the conversation or thoughts that's going on, at least, I you know, from my perspective, I don't want to speak for the board, but it's, it's a difficult and interesting conversation that we're in that in this era of what the state legislature, um, you know, the executive branch um, have put upon, particularly us here in Davidson County and even Shelby County, if you even go, if you want to extend it fully even to the voucher situation, of how we do that. Um, and so um, I think I just want to put that out there to understand like our whole thought process, or at least my thought process, I don't want to speak for everyone, about um, also responsibility. If um, state coming to over, over our decision, they should take some responsibility in that. Um, and the question is also like, how do we have that? And so hopefully maybe we have a bigger discussion at the retreat about um, either potential legislation coming up about how to refine this charter reform um, part of more on the state side of their responsibility um, if they're going to override an LEA um, and having more collaborative part with us on the local level, with the state level, um, and then also uh, what does that look like physically because also you kind of feel like if you're going to take the responsibility of approving it, they should have more of a financial buy-in also. Um, of being having that having that conversation, so I just want to set that out just as a conversation, um, as we kind of think through this, um, because um, looking from a kind of thirty fifty thousand point of view, um, it's we're looking at both the fifty thousand view, then we're also looking at the ten point point of view um, of how do you interact, especially with the charter school not be able to have a um, the charter office, excuse me, not having a way to communicate, and then um, also acknowledging. Um, Rocket ship wanting to have a having relationship with us um, and doing it with a short amount of time and very limited data. Um, so uh, I just want to make that statement. I've had some comments. Anyone else have comments before I speak? Mm -hmm. Okay, Ms. Bush. Um, you know, the state is not always our friend when it comes to uh, making a decision for our charters. We know that. Um, we also know that the, the state wasn't our friend when it, you know, when it was time to close knowledge academies. Right, but we do know, and we do have things in place from the by the charter office that can put measures in place to make sure and ensure moving forward. Oh, yeah, uh -huh. yes, time to go. Get me with a guitar. Time to go. <laughs> yes, Ready dance. Oh, oh, ah. there we go. it was me. Okay, it was me. It was six forty-eight. <laughs> <laughs> it was. All right, so let me wrap this up real quick. Um, <coughs> as I was stating, that now we have a charter office that is able to go in and put uh, ramifications and um, 
put things in place to make sure that we can oversee and have oversight of what happens, let's say, for example, with Knowledge Academies. <coughs> now it's back in our laps, and it is, we're charging the charter, uh, charter office to uh, put the sanctions in place, which would be probation, and we're able to control the next steps for Knowledge Academies. Again, I never said the state was our friend. This is an opportunity for us to make sure that we continue that road with our charter schools. How many charter schools have been closed by the charter office, Dennis? Uh, I believe there's been like four that have closed throughout the course of our authorization. And that was through the charter office. Is that through the work from the charter office as far as once information was presented to the charter office as far as any type of um, problems, yeah, it was, it was initiated through the charter office. Uh, to my knowledge, they all agreed to close based on mostly financial kinds of issues. We've closed only one since I've been here. There were about three, I believe, prior to that that were closed. And the reason they closed through because of financial problems was because it was brought to the charter's office attention, and then therefore the steps and the process took its place. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah they, they agreed to close, and so it was not a, really a, uh, an argument with them. That's great. Um, and also, I just want to get clarification about the application. If I understand correctly, we're not voting on the application to be approved. Is that correct? I heard my colleagues say that. I was just trying to get verification. Yeah, about what they yeah. would be voting on tonight. Yeah. That the application has been a, basically approved by the state. state. Uh -huh. So the, the school is coming. This is just whether or not MMPS wants to be the LEA. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that from the public viewing that we clarify that we're not trying, we're not voting to approve the application. Is that clear? Is that, we got it all right? Okay. Um, so I just want to make sure we got that corrected. Um, we're here just to vote on oversight. Is that correct? Again, just want to make sure on the board floor that we're clear on what we're voting on. So that's my um, take, again, of oversight for our charter schools. Um, again, it is what it is. The state made their decision to approve the charter application. Thank you. That's all. Okay, Ms. Spearing. Uh, Dennis, uh, you said that five out of 28 <coughs> of our schools, of the charter schools, are high performing. Uh, is that correct? Th there are five that are low performing that are in our tier three. Oh, that five are low performing. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That are. That's about 20%. Um, uh, how many of our district schools are low performing? <coughs> Percentage wise, I mean, it's, well, we'll, we can talk about that maybe sure. in a retreat. Um, some of the people who spoke to uh, the board tonight uh, about rocket ship talked about local control, and obviously, uh, that just seems like uh, uh, a, a misnomer here because uh, they obviously did not respect local control when they, when we <coughs> voted to deny their application. And yet they went over and uh, and went to the state, got permission. So I say um, rocket ship did not uh, respect our decision uh, when we denied their application. And I believe that the state uh, decided to um, overrule us, and the state should be the one <coughs> to uh, take care of that charter, who oversee that charter. Okay, um, I just had a few comments about this. And at first, I just want to, Ms. Bugs mentioned ideology, uh, ideology and differences in that area. And I want to clarify um, my thoughts about charter schools because it's not about ideology over governance structure or anything like that. Um, so I'm going to be real specific. First of all, charters increase segregation. There's evidence that charters are increasing racial and socioeconomic segregation, as well as a segregation of EL learners and um, special needs kids. Charters have a negative fiscal impact um, on our district and, and throughout the nation. Um, we have lots of evidence of misuse of taxpayer dollars by charter schools, as evidenced most recently by Knowledge Academies. Um, I have deep concerns about the treatment of children at No Excuses Charter Schools. Rocket Ship is a prime example of very extreme No Excuses tactics. Um, when um, we are building <laughs> charter schools, oftentimes the money that is pay, the taxpayer money that is used to pay for that school 
goes to investors, excuse me, it goes to investors. So instead of paying off a property that will now belong to the city of Nashville, we are paying off a property for investors. And specifically in this instance, Rocket Ship partners with Andre Agassi's firm, and they were very open about this being a, a, an opportunity for them to make money. They said, well, we can serve some kids and we can also get money, so it's a great deal for everybody, and that's what drives a lot of um, the expansion of charter chains. Um, and so, so as a, in a general sense, let me be very clear that this is about the impact on the children in our system. It is about the impact on our community. It's about the impact on, um, uh, you know, the taxpayers and where our money is going. So this is not about sort of ideology about type of school or governance model or anything like that. These are very serious concerns that I have that are rooted in the best interest of children in our district. Um, so to talk about this particular charter school, um, I've already mentioned the issue with Andre Agassi. Um, I've talked about no excuses. Um, Rocket Ship has had some very bad test scores. In fact, they were in the bottom 3% of schools in the state. And um, when, when the school was very low performing, the state insisted that we open another rocket ship charter here. And they stayed open less than a year um, and just closed. So it's just sort of like the fast food version of schools. And that has a negative impact on communities. Um, the, I would agree with Ms. Spearing that if you want to say that you want to, if, you, if a school wants to say, we want to partner with you as a district, if, if the local board turns down the application, the school should respect that because that's not being a good partner. So we are automatically starting out in an adversarial position. And in 2013, when the charter authorizer law was up for debate and it passed, I believe it, was two, it may have been 2014, I went up to the legislature and testified and I talked about the problems of this becoming an adversarial relationship between uh, school districts and charter schools and school districts in the state, and I called it a shotgun wedding, and that's what it is, because now we're all stuck here <laughs> and we're gonna have to figure out what to do about it. But the state continues to four schools on us. They now have passed a new law which forms a new commission which is now uh, fully appointed uh, by the governor um, with very pro-charter interests. So I expect that every charter school we turn down is gonna go to the state and we are going to um, have that back in front of us. At some point, the state is gonna have to be accountable for the poor test scores, for the misuse of money, for the fraud, um, for all these things that we're seeing. and. I, I, I do like the idea of being able to shut down a school that is poorly operating, but I think that may be the only real advantage we have here because, um, you know, the, they're going to get small fee, but, it, but we're going to have a lot of manpower and overseeing this school and monitoring this school. And so I just think at some point the state has to be held accountable and has to take responsibility for these bad test scores that they're gonna impose on us. I know we still have to pay for the school. We don't have a choice on that, but I, I just think now is the time to go ahead and say, if you wanna force us to have a school that we have said we don't need or want, then you can take responsibility for it. And that's all I have. Any other comments? I have a question. Yes. <coughs> Ms. Car Ms. Harkey. Is it appropriate for us to begin engaging the state more directly or the state board about these kind of conversations and about the long lasting impact on Nashville as a whole? Because it seems like we end up back at the table, but we just haven't really engaged them, at least with the council when we said, hey, we aren't getting the money that we need for our teachers and for our students. They were at least willing to engage us and at least some were able to flip, you know? So how, how feasible is it? How appropriate is it for us to engage the state and talk to them about what our fiscal questions are and concerns are about them overriding our, our, our votes. I don't know how feasible or how, how you go about doing that, but certainly as part of your, your advocacy role on behalf of the MPS board, I certainly think you can, you can enter into conversations with the state board, the new committee, um, about how, how this is impacting the MNPS board and district. Okay, and I, yeah, and others might have some other idea. I mean, like, I would encourage you to kind of reach out to some of the other administration here, and they might have other ideas on how we can can engage and, and advocate with the state. 
Um, but certainly legally, it is, is something that you are, okay. are welcome to do. And then again, Mr. Queen and Dr. Battle, you may not be prepared to, do you have any kind of recommendation? I mean, this is, I, I just, I keep shrugging my shoulders because I really don't know. I mean, I, at the end of the day, my thing is, students, 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 you know, this school is, is opening. Like, it is opening. So do we want to say, hey, no matter how we feel about whatever's going to happen at the school, if it's under our control, we have the oversight? Or do we say, well, all right, state, you know, we are getting tired of you all overriding us, so we want you all to to, to handle it and to manage it. So at all, any thoughts? Um, Dennis, you can come Rough on up. I, I, I think um, Ms. Corey Harkey opened up this morning just with a general um, <coughs> statement around the um, advantages or disadvantages around um, local versus state control, and I think those are the fair um, ways to uh, present and share what this board should be considering. Gotcha. Um, Dennis, I don't know. Yeah, if I would just say, you know, we our office and review team did due diligence uh, when the application was presented. Uh, we presented our findings to this board. We did give a recommendation at the time. They did meet standard uh, uh, when we presented it. So it's, I, I think it's kind of beyond me making an additional recommendation because uh, we did we turned it over to the board at I this point you. to have a decision. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I just had two responses. First of all, I want to reiterate that the role of the charter office is very different than the role of the board. The charter office is looking at a rubric and saying, do they meet standards? Do they have test scores? Um, do we have complaints on the schools? Whatever factors are looking at. So if they meet those factors, the charter's office is going to recommend that we open, open them. Um, but the board's job is to determine the impact it will have on the district, the impact it will have on other schools, whether we really want to have, you know, the school, they're going to look at a very, the charter office is going to look at a very limited set of factors. We have to look at a larger set of factors. And I, I am encouraged because I've had a conversation with Dr. Battle about having some larger um, conversation as conversations as the board, um, hopefully at our upcoming retreat, um, about our vision that we have and whether these charter schools fit into the vision, the strategic plan, that kind of thing. So I think we are constantly just trying to check a box on when we get an application. Well, it's, it's recommended, approved, move on, rather than saying, how does this impact us and do we really need it? And the other thing is, I will say, I have been advocating um, since 2012 on these issues. I've been at the legislature. I've written letters to the state board. As far as I can see, they really don't care what we have to say. I mean, I think it's a good thing to continue to try to engage, but I see that there's not, I don't believe that there will be any change if we all um, start having discussions with the state board, but certainly don't want to discourage that. So that's all I have to say, Ms. Pupa Walker. No, I totally agree that one, the legislature is not going to be swayed by us. That's just not Let's, be, committee, let's live though. in reality, number one. <laughs> um, and number two, I agree that there, the, the obligation of Dennis, Dennis's office is to, and I have served as a, as a chair of a review committee several years. It is a very comprehensive process, but I also, I recommend a couple of things. I recommend one, that all of you consider sitting in on some of those sessions and hearing and looking through the applications and the process just to get a sense for what is expected on that, through that process. They interview the board of the charter op, um, operator. But then I actually totally agree, Amy, that then when that decision comes to us, what is the criteria we are using, right? So we should also be handed, okay, if it's going to be on Bell Road, what do we know about that community? What do we know about the schools in that community? What do we know about, what are the factors that we have to take into consideration that uh, Dennis's office does not? Otherwise, it's relatively arbitrary. Like we're making real assumptions on how much does it cost? How long does it take? Who gets to decide what, right? Um, so I just think that is an exercise that has value is to, and I think it speaks to uh, Frida's comments about the role that we play, like we should be thoughtful about this process and that not every charter school, not, they're not cookie cutter schools. Not all schools are the same. Um, they, and so anyway, I just think that's a great idea. <coughs> Okay, Ms. Elrod. Um, I, I agree with those comments. Um, I think that's why, for me, it's just a simple gut check of it has a negative fiscal impact on our schools, and that is one of my main roles is to protect our, our budgets. And so um, that's, that's my gut check of since we don't have that information because we don't have those rubrics for ourselves created as a board or we 
recently or you know found out that we we're going to be talking about this again. Um, I just I'm not, I'm, uh, no matter how great a charter school may be, I'm just unwilling to be complicit in that cycle of continuing to underfund our schools um, at the expense of some others. And so um, that's that's my gut check on it. I'd like to call the question. Okay, so I'm going to attempt to restate your Easy. motion, <laughs> so which sorry. is we have a motion to deny local governance of rocket ship Nashville number three. Okay. All right. Um, all in favor to deny. Okay. That's majority and all in favor. All opposed. <laughs> opposed. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so it, it, so we have denied um, local governance. All right, the motion passes. Uh, so we're going to turn now to board committee reports and start with budget and finance with Ms. Pooper Walker. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we had a budget and finance committee meeting uh, this afternoon, and Mr. Henson um, presented to us an amended budget that was um, reflected the teacher salary increases at the mid-year mark. It also reflected an increase in uh, costs up to almost a million dollars for, uh, for the new water rates. So I should pull it out in front of me. I think the total amount, the amen amendment was for $7,578,000 and that was approved tonight by the committee. Um, and so we obviously were excited to deliver raises to our staff, but also anguished about having to dip into our um, reserves to do so. And we hope to not have to do that anymore. So. Thank you. Um, and then our final report is on the director search, and I'll make this very short and sweet. We met today uh, at 3.30 to discuss a proposed contract for our next director of schools and the salary range that we would like to see. Ultimately, we are going to be asking for more information from the Tennessee School Boards Association to help us uh, to help inform our decision, and we will have another discussion at our board retreat on January 10th um, and hopefully finalize uh, some of those details. So uh, now I will turn to announcements and we'll go ahead and start with Ms. Elrod. Thank you. So first I would like to thank Overton High School um, as they have, <clears throat> they've had their students uh, share with us their sketch artwork and um, their important work on identity. <coughs> Additionally, I would like to just say on that note that I really uh, enjoy us having student voice here in our board meetings and I would like us to consider as a board ha having that more often, not just occasionally. We have a treasure trove of um, talent and I think it's worth us showing that off. I mean, it's a great part of, um, it's the best part of our meetings personally. Um, on that note, today I went to Two Rivers Middle School to help uh, with the boxes for our HERO program. And um, just, you should never underestimate a middle schooler. It was so impressive to see them. Um, and they were just, they were so wonderful and it really did my heart some good. Um, and I guess on that note, we recently had a student death in, um, within my district. And so once again, unfortunately I made the same announcement two weeks ago, the holidays are not always wonderful for everybody and so treat everybody with peace and grace. And lastly, on Thursday, I have uh, the mayor's night out at Shane Elementary at six o'clock. Anyone and everyone is available and welcome to come. Um, and it will be with Mayor Cooper, myself, and some other people um, entertaining information and questions from whomever decides to attend. Thank you. Cooper Walker. Um, I want to start by giving a shout out to Corey Harkey, who is leaving us to go to TSU to other, not greener, other pastures. And um, <laughs> yeah. thank you for your service to Metro Schools and all your hard work, and we have appreciated your counsel. And <laughs> back and see us. Um, I also want to thank the Tennessean for their Adopt a Teacher campaign. I think that's a really meaningful and thoughtful um, um, effort to help our folks. Um, we would love to not have to raise money to adopt teachers, but just to pay them and give them everything they need. That would be the goal. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Um, I also want to give a shout out to two Hillsborough students who, um, hang on a second. 
two students from Hillsborough High School uh, from their online student newspaper who have been chosen to work with News Channel 5 on a national news literacy campaign. Um, they will work collaboratively with Channel 5 to develop a relevant news package and will be part of its inception all the way to publication, uh, airing on Channel 5 locally and on, channel, on CBS stations across the country. These are Abby Kutcher and Asha Murchison. And then we had uh, a student, Alan Cook, from Hillsborough, who made the All-State Band in five different instruments, which is a first ever. And um, I believe that's it. I want to wish all of our staff, families, and, and everybody um, happy holidays and a restful break. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bucks. Uh, yes, so thank you to uh, Council Lady Berkeley, Allen, and all of the community members who joined us yesterday evening at the Edge, I mean, at the uh, Midtown's Precinct to talk about the new batting cage coming up, or I'm sorry, batting cage, batting facility being erected by Belmont free of charge to MMPS. Um, I think being able to bring these community partners together, especially a university with such distinction and, uh, you know, who's willing to finance this as well as bringing the community members who will be benefiting from that, having this in conversation was just really good to be able to talk through what pros and cons might be, what frustrations were initially, and then being able to move forward. Just really appreciative of that. Um, the Chamber Report Card Committee will be presenting their findings or their research next week. It's just good to be able to coordinate with our business community who typically, to be frank, don't typically send their students to MMPS schools. They're not typically engaged with MMPS schools at, at the high level that we would want them to. So I think being able to engage with them and talk through their recommendations is always beneficial to our students. So thank them, I thank them for that. Lastly, Southern Word will be having their showcase Okay, so I don't really remember all the details. <laughs> Please feel free to email me because I do not want to misspeak again, but I know it's coming up. It's great, like, too. Southern words. This right. Friday or next Thursday. <laughs> Soon, before Christmas yeah, break. Okay. So it's between now, between and now and next Friday. See, that's why I rock with you. It's between now and next Friday. Uh, but all jokes aside, Southern Word, they go out into the community free of charge. They empower our students uh, to speak from the heart, to use their voice. And I just really appreciate their showcase each year. I know it's been at Lipscomb in the past, but for some reason I don't think it's there this year. So please reach out to me. I'll give you details. Um, Meg's MLK and Hume Fogg recently engaged in either talent shows or presentations of some sort through a musical. So I just appreciate all of the, the ways that our students are showcasing their talent and the, the <coughs> educators that support them. Before I ramble anymore, thank you and good night. We have an announcement tonight from Dr. Battle. Um, just to piggyback on the announcement from uh, Ms. Bo Walker, um, thank you again, Corey, for your service. Um, the Metro Legal Director, Bob Cooper, has named Melissa Roberge as Corey's replacement. She's here with us tonight, um, so welcome. <laughs> Melissa has a um, very colorful and um, expertise um, background, um, <laughs> so we're looking forward to working closely uh, with you um, in MPS and um, as the school board, so thank you so much. And Ms. Bush? Um, first and foremost, I want to say, um, and this is me, I just want to get off my heart and spirit, um, that I was very disappointed in y'all's vote tonight to um, help uh, make sure that our students are taken care of at Rocket Ship. Um, that is huge on Bell Road. That is huge in our Antioch community, and that is huge not to be able to talk to my constituents if they have any problems, any concerns, um, or cares about what happens to those students at Rocket Ship. So I do want to make it um, public, publicly known that I'm very disappointed in this board for making that decision. They've already got the uh, application approved. We're already paying the money, and therefore we have no type of um, oversight, which is really a punch. Um, so let's pray that those children are taken care of because it was all about uh, a political game here tonight. It wasn't about the children. Um, so I want to make that statement. I also want to know um, where we are. You'll be meeting with them on Monday as far as the workers um, getting paid. Uh, we'll, we'll give me some uh, feedback about that, please. Because we haven't gotten anything from the board since last month as far as the workers getting paid. 
Um, so, and David Prophet is here. If, he, if you need to add anything, feel free. Um, there, um, according to my statement that I shared earlier, um, we've ha been in conversation. There have been meetings um, prior to today. There is another meeting that's scheduled um, for Monday based upon additional documentation that has been received so that we can um, partner and hopefully get this thing resolved as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, Mr. Prophet, can you come up, please? Where are we with this? I, I just heard Dr. Battle and uh, want to know how quickly we're going to move on resolving the issue for the workers. Orion Construction at this point in time um, is looking at alternative ways to, to make this um, issue resolved within a very short amount of time. In the past, they have asked over and over again, several times documented for certain items and if those items were provided, they could assess what the actual amount of money is owed. There's, there is conflicting information on both sides. They've asked for that information. It's not been given to them. Had they been given it to them, they could have resolved it in a matter of minutes. When you say, who are they? Are you talking about the subcontractors? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Both Joe Haas Concrete and RSA. And so the Monday meeting is going to be about? That Monday meeting is to set with all the parties to determine what um, can happen, look at what monies were owed, what monies were paid, by whom, when, and all of the factors so that we can get a very clear picture as to sort of a roadmap of where things are. My hope and goal is that prior to that, that we have this resolved. Can we get an update, please, after the yes, meeting? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I appreciate you. When would you like the update? Uh, after the meeting, that's great. You can, you can send it to the entire board. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for coming up. That's all for me. Flair Peters. Um, you know, just given my past life, for those you know, I used to work for a labor union, so all work has dignity and deserves respect and uh, wage theft is unacceptable, and I put that statement out there, so I hope it comes to resolve. I want to thank Dr. Battle and Mr. Prophet. I know it's not an easy process to go through, and you're working through it, so I appreciate your efforts of trying to resolve and mitigate this issue and continue, um, no. to, continue to come to a resolution. So hopefully um, we will come to a resolution sooner than later, but understanding that um, it's not always a simple and easy process, and just thank you for at least trying to go through this. and. We hope we'll resolve it sooner and better that everyone um, can come to, a, to agreement that, um, that comes to a consensus and that's fair and equitable. So just thank you for going through this process and I know it's not easy um, to do. Um, also, just a reminder to teachers, collaborative conferencing voting is going on until December, till this Friday, December 13th, um, 5 p.m. So I um, encourage teachers to vote. Um, and then also <coughs> thank you to the Glencliff ambassadors for giving the wonderful update about their academies. Um, I really appreciate it and being a shining light in our district. Um, and also I'd like to recognize uh, the holidays, holiday store that was at Witsit. Um, the PTA did a great job of collecting shoes and book, book bags and uh, sports equipment and everything else. So also to have a, um, a holiday store for parents and families to come in that's affordable for them to come in. Um, we have a lot of working families in Nashville becoming very expensive, have a way to provide a, um, a Christmas to their uh, children um, and, and Hanukkah. Um, and so just want to recognize that for all the hard work in the PTA that really worked hard with Community Partner School to make sure that happened for the families of Woodsit. And I was happy to contribute, couldn't make it to the uh, actual story the following day of a family emergency, but I'm just glad that we have great community partners that are really trying to serve our students and our families the way they are. Um, so thank you and happy holidays, everyone. Um, so I also wanted to wish Ms. Harkey, uh, congratulate her on a new position and wish her bon voyage and we've enjoyed working with you and also want to welcome Ms. Roberge and um, thank you for your patience and with me tonight as I learned how to chair a meeting which feels a little different sitting up here um, and uh, following the meeting we are going to have a closed hearing which is not open to the public so I would just ask that you um, quickly and quietly uh, clear the room uh, as we adjourn and we're going to take probably a 10 minute break and then we'll be back in here for the hearing so with that this meeting is adjourned thank you Word.
it was a link. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.